Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in, uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions, have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road, and we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays, and we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Paul wrote to the Corinthians to rebuke, to correct, to instruct, and to encourage, and to show them one of the most important principles really the most important principle in the Word of God concerning their lives, and it's love. There was much sin in the church at Corinth, which included sexual sin and pride over position and power, prestige. There was disunity, factions, lawsuits, and hatred towards one another. It was a very dysfunctional group of believers. And Paul's two letters to the church were aimed at bringing the people back to the central part of the gospel message. You may be thinking, I'm not like that. I don't know people like that. You may be saying, hey, this church is not like that. We're not experiencing anything like the Corinthian church was experienced, but let me remind you of something. We have the same fallen nature and we're prone to sin. And though there may be some differences, there are also many similarities. You see, one of the most tragic truths in life is that the evil and darkness in this world comes to a great degree from within the hearts of men and women. The prophet Jeremiah prophesied and said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Deceitful, the word in the Hebrew means fraudulent, destructive, insidious, harmful, sly, crooked. Then you add the word wicked. Desperately wicked means frail, incurable, sick, woeful. The biblical illustrator says the deceitfulness of the heart is a part of its wickedness. The wickedness of the human heart is here spoken of as being desperate. It is a disease which has gone to the last degree, which has spread itself through all the powers of the mind, through all the vitals of the soul. We will not be improved merely as we advance in knowledge, as we receive merely the chastisements of divine providence, as we merely come under the instruction of the word of God. No affliction would sanctify, no outward means would purify. The grace of God alone is adequate to do the work. It's been said to be 
sensible how men in general are depraved, we need only consult history and consider the common state of the world. These will give us a hideous representation of human disorder and iniquities, both public and private, national and personal. See, there are many people today that actually believe, they actually even teach that the human nature is perfectible. The belief is that as a culture, we are basically good and getting even better. And the Bible reveals the complete opposite. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, he says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Paul said to the church at Rome in his letter to them, he said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Philosopher and atheist John Gray stated, in comparison with the Genesis myth, the modern myth in which humanity is marching toward a better future is mere superstition. As the Genesis story teaches, knowledge cannot save us from ourselves. If we know more than before, it means only that we have a greater scope to enact our fantasies. The message of Genesis is that in the most vital area of human life, there can be no progress, only an unending struggle with our nature. Paul addresses the issues that the Corinthian church was experienced. He gives much clarity in how the body of Christ should function with each other and how the gifts of the Holy Spirit should operate. So let's focus on how he finishes chapter 12 with these powerful words that lead into the very heart of God. And now I will show you, he said, the most excellent way. What is the most excellent way? And, and how can we live in the most excellent way if our hearts are deceitful and, and desperately wicked? As we look at the second part of Jeremiah 17, 9, there, there's a question presented to us. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know your heart? You may not know what lies even deep within the core of your heart, yet God knows everything. Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. Psalm 139, 1, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. Psalm 7, 9, O righteous God who searches minds and hearts. You see, God knows and understands everything about the heart of a person. He knows what man is capable of. He knows man's wickedness and waywardness. He knows the depths of who we are. That is why he's committed to transform and to renew and to create in you and me a new and a clean heart, a heart that will be committed to him and to others with love that flows from his love. I have stated many times that we are living in what is called the dispensation of grace between the first and second advents of Jesus, a time for experiencing God's grace, his forgiveness and salvation and the hope of eternal life. It is a very, very, very good thing to dwell on the words of Jesus spoken during his first advent. It says, Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Timothy Keller 
says, now you do, he says, now do you see what would happen, what have happened to at Jesus' first coming to earth if he'd come with a sword in his hand and a power to destroy all sources of suffering and evil? It would have meant that there would be no human being left. If you don't think that is fair, I would argue that you don't know your own capabilities. You don't know your own heart. But Jesus did not come to earth the first time to bring justice, but rather to bear it. He came not with a sword in his hand, but with nails through his hand. So this leads us to our first point. God's commitment of love towards you through Christ is the only cure for the condition of your heart. God's commitment of love towards you through the person of Jesus Christ is the only cure for the condition of your heart. Because the Lord can create within us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us through the power and the indwelling Holy Spirit, we've been given a commandment that all of us know, yet most of us fall very short in carrying it out. Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the other commandments and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commitments. All of what a person will ever be and do is wrapped up in these two commandments. They are mankind's marching orders for life. You may think it's impossible to carry out these commandments, but Paul stayed, stated, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let me remind you that when you know what you should do and say, I can't, you're really only saying one of two things, God can't or I won't. So the question here is, what are the results of failing to love as God has commanded? Letter A, without the transforming love of Jesus in your heart, what you declare will be defective. Without the transforming love of Jesus, the power of Christ in your heart, what you declare will be defective. Paul said to the church at Corinth, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love. Among the Corinthians, the power of speaking a foreign language was regarded as prestigious and very valuable. And there were some leaders in the church who thought very highly of themselves. The language of angels may have the meaning of the highest power of using language, evidently ensuing the idea that the angels are superior in all respects to human beings. They were, also, they were also misusing the spiritual gift of tongues and interpretation. And Paul goes on to say that if you have this gift without exhibiting love for one another, it means nothing. He says, I have become sounding brass. The sounding instrument makes a great noise and, and being of great importance. And yet without life, just an instrument of metal that merely makes a sound, a noisy, valueless empty, lifeless instrument would be the power of speaking all the languages of the world without love. I've become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Cymbals have no melody, no harmony, and would contribute nothing to the welfare of others. It would be hollow, vain, and of no value. It, it could neither save oneself or others any more than the notes of the trumpet or the jingle of a, a cymbal would promote salvation. The result is all that we would proclaim in life would be imperfect. It would be defective. This leads us to, to letter B. Without the love of Jesus in your heart, your discernment will be deficient. Your discernment will be deficient. He says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, the ability to know the meaning and type and figures in the Old Testament, and all the unexplored secrets of nature and all the knowledge of art and science or have such power, powerful discernment and sacred things that you could solve the greatest difficulties. But without love, 
you would still be deficient in the things of God. Let her see without the love of Jesus in your heart, your convictions will be unproductive. He says, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Even if you have great convictions and beliefs that, that you strictly live by, faith that brings you through many trials, and in the end you have no love for God and man, and if you have only lived your life out of duty, then your life has been in reality unproductive, barren, and fruitless. Your faith and your beliefs will have no life in them without and apart from loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Letter D, without the love of Jesus in your heart, your charity will be unrewarding. He says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, even if you gave all your money, if you gave it away to the poor, even if you became poor for the sake of the poor, it would still, still be unrewarding and in the end of no value if you don't have love. Letter E, without lo the love of Jesus in your heart, your, your conquests will be unacceptable. He says, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. There are many modern day martyrs. There were people in the past, suicide bombers, 9-11 fanatics that use planes as bombs and so on, who, who give their lives up for their faith but they do not know the love of Jesus Christ. If they did, then that love would motivate them to act completely different than the way they did act. See, without love, the sacrifices people make in this life profit them nothing, even if they make them in the name of their God. All of these things would be of no value. They cannot save. Furthermore, without the transforming love of Jesus, a person will remain unredeemed and un, an unpardoned sinner. They'll fall short of the glory of God and fail to fulfill the great purposes which God has designed. They will fail to understand the true meaning of salvation and the purpose of their existence. And none of these things could be placed before God as a ground of acceptance in the day of judgment. Unless one possesses the love of Christ, they are utterly lost. And unless a person's committed to love God and others, no matter what they claim, they're living a lie. This brings us to number two. There is no evidence of true faith without the commitment and exhibition of God's love. There is no evidence of true faith without the commitment and exhibition of of God's life, love. Paul said to the church at Galatia, he said, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So love is a principle put into a deed. It's a choice. At times, love is giving a person what they need not, what they, what they deserve. Faith expressing itself through love is not a solitary, isolated reality. It's an expression of a commitment. Letter A, your commitments reveal who and what you love. Your commitments, what you love the most reveals who and what you are. In his first epistle, John said, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. It's been said that our commitment to each other is a reflection of our dedication and devotion to Christ who pronounced his vows for us on Calvary's cross. On the cross, he demonstrated his love for us. On the cross, he thought of us and gave himself for our well-being. His processional wasn't down a rose-petaled aisle, but down the Via Della Rosa. His wedding music was a death march. His altar was the blood-stained timber of Calvary. His wedding ring was the crown of thorns atop his brow. But truer vows have never been spoken, and richer love has never been seen. You see, the love of God through the person of Jesus is revealed to us in the ultimate commitment 
and it's the laying down of your life. John recorded Jesus as saying, as the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You see, commitment means an assumed responsibility, something that takes up time or energy. Commitment means loyalty, devotion, dedication to a cause, a person, or a relationship. And this brings us to point number three. The love of Jesus compels us to suffer and to sacrifice and to serve. The love of Jesus compels us to suffer and to sacrifice and to serve. You see, Paul continues to the church at Corinth. He says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. It does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The New Living Translation, paraphrased Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. Whatever we do, it is because Christ's love controls us, compels us. Since we believe that Christ died for everyone, we also believe that we have all died to the old life we used to live. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live to please themselves. Instead, they will live to please Christ who died and was raised for them. The word controls or compels means to hold together lest it fall to pieces or something fall away from it. It means to be constrained. Galatians 5.13, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. You see, the basic building blocks of society simply erode without commitment. Beyond the ramifications for society as a whole, beyond the healing of cultural fragmentation, even beyond the obvious necessity of Christian commitment, when we refuse to commit, we miss out on one of the great joys of life. When we obsess over ourselves, or our narrow plans of our plans of shared self-interest, we lose the meaning of life, which is to know and serve God and to love and serve our neighbors. 33 research scientists investigated the relationship between human development and community in a 2003 report, Hardwired to Connect. Their research revealed that we are biologically primed to find meaning through relationships. By abandoning, abandoning commitment, our narcissistic culture has lost the one thing it desperately seeks, happiness. Without commitment, our individual lives will be barren and sterile. That's done by 33 research scientists who investigated the relationship between human development and community. You see, many of us listening, many of us here today, we've been hurt, we've been disappointed, we've been crushed. There's been times where we've dis been disillusioned, especially concerning love and relationships. We have tried and we have failed. We have sinned and have been sinned against. We have two options though, forgive and be forgiven. And then get back up and fulfill the great commandment, to love God and to love others. One of the best ways I know when it comes to dealing with sin and failure is to cling to one of the greatest promises in the Bible. And it's right here. Number four, the love of God never fails. Say that with me. The love of God never fails. Say it again. The love of God never fails. You see 1 Corinthians 3, 8, love never fails. 
The love of God cannot fail. And when God is in your heart, that means you won't fail. At some point, God is going to so possess you that you're going to love as he does. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says, Love never fails. It will never come to an end because it's eternal. This is not true of the spiritual gifts. Every gift is linked in some way to building up the church to maturity. When that perfection is achieved, the gifts will have served their purposes and will be rendered obsolete. But this will not happen to love. In his book, How to Be Born Again, Billy Graham writes, there is a well-known story of some men in Scotland who had spent the day fishing. That evening, they were having tea in a little inn. And one of the fishermen, in a characteristic gesture to describe the size of the fish that got away, slung out his hands just as the little waitress was getting ready to set the cup of tea at his place. His hand and the teacup collided, dashing the tea against the whitewashed walls. Immediately, an ugly brown stain began to spread over the wall. The man who did it was very embarrassed and apologized profusely. But one of the other guests just jumped up and said, never mind. And pulling a pen from his pocket, he began to sketch around the ugly brown stain. Soon there emerged a picture of a magnificent royal stag with his antlers spread. The artist was Sir Edward Landseer, England's foremost painter of animals. This story is always, has always beautifully illustrated to me the fact that if we confess not only our sins but our mistakes to God, he can make out of them something for our good and his glory. Sometimes it's harder to confess our mistakes and stupidities to God than it is our sins. Mistakes and stupidities seem so dumb, whereas sin seems more or less to be an outcropping of our human nature. But Romans 8.28 tells us that if we are committed to God, he can make them work together for our good and for his glory. In Luke chapter 22, Simon, Simon, Jesus said, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Satan seeks to sift every one of us. He seeks to divide us. He seeks to kick us when we're down so that we'll stay there. But do you hear these words of Jesus? I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, when you've gotten up and you've turned back to me, and I have strengthened you, you go and you strengthen others. As Romans 8, 31 through 35 says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He too, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to the life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. But I have prayed for you, Simon. I've prayed for you, Peter. I've prayed for you, Stuart. I've prayed for you, Mark. I've prayed for you, Dale. I've prayed for you, Melissa. I've prayed for you, Pam. As a believer, we need to dwell on the four pillars of the Christian faith. And remember that as a Christian, Full of the love of Christ, you can never be condemned because, number one, Christ has died. Number two, Christ has risen again. Number three, Christ is at the right hand of God. And number four, Christ makes intercession for you. He's died. He's risen again. He's at the right hand of the Father. He makes intercession for us. Christ Jesus has an unchangeable and everlasting priesthood. He still carries on in heaven. 
Intercession in general signifies a pleading and entreaty with one person in behalf of another. We being unworthy of access to God in our own name, Jesus is our intercessor to plead our case with the Father and to procure and dispose to us the blessings of his purchase. By this intercession of Christ, God is glorified. It is a striking testimony to God's awful majesty and infinite purity that he has appointed a standing mediator between him and us and will confer no grace upon us but through him. And it is at the same time an eminent instance of his love and grace that he has appointed such a glorious intercessor to plead our case in heaven. You see, because of his commitment to the Father's will and work, Jesus saves us, he forgives us, he cleanses us, he transforms us, he prays for us, he keeps us. He never leaves us. He's with us. And most of all, he is committed to us with an everlasting, boundless, unchangeable, unconditional love. As God is committed to us in Christ Jesus our Lord, may we be committed to him. Paul wrote in his letter to the church at Ephesus. I'm going to read this in, through the Living Bible. And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within you as you trust in him. And may your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. God's never failing love. Let it possess you. Let it change you. As you surrender your will, as you surrender your pride, God will live in you and make you because he's praying for you. Thank <laughs> you.